This is Senator J. William Fulbright from Arkansas, the congressional sponsor of the Fulbright Act of 1946 and co-sponsor of the Fulbright-Hayes Act of 1961. This year marks the 75th and 60th anniversaries of these landmark pieces of legislation. Born in 1905, Fulbright grew up in Fayetteville in northwest Arkansas and graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1924. Then he spent three years as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and returned to the United States to study law at George Washington University. In 1943, he was elected to the House of Representatives, and in 1945, he successfully ran for the Senate, where he served five terms until 1974 and became the longer-serving chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In 1955, Fulbright said that three factors inspired his proposal to establish the exchange program that came to bear his name. He called my experience as a Rhodes Scholar the dominant influence in the creation of the Fulbright Awards, but he added two others, starting with the devastation of the Second World War. Fulbright immediately recognized the implications of the nuclear age for international politics and later referred to the atomic bombings in Japan as the immediate cause of my sponsorship of the legislation to set up an exchange program. Finally, Fulbright mentioned the existence of large, uncollectible foreign credits, windfall income that the United States was accruing overseas in non-convertible currencies from the sale of wartime surpluses. The U.S. government had billions of dollars of wartime material stockpiled overseas in former theaters of war in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. Building material, fuel, vehicles, medicine, food. These assets, which the historian Sam Lebovich has called war junk, were complicated and expensive to maintain. Foreign governments did not have the U.S. dollars to buy them, so the U.S. government decided to accept non-convertible foreign currencies as payment in order to sell them. On September 27, 1945, just weeks after World War II ended, Fulbright rose in the Senate and proposed a bill authorizing the use of credits established through the sale of surplus properties abroad for the promotion of international goodwill through the exchanges of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. Fulbright initially introduced his bill without consulting the State Department. It was his idea and a congressional initiative. Fulbright's bill was based on a simple but ingenious idea, amending a piece of legislation that had nothing to do with education or exchanges in order to finance educational exchanges. This was the Surplus Property Act of 1944. The purpose of the Surplus Property Act was to help the U.S. transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy by selling off wartime surpluses at home and abroad, and this created windfall revenues in non-convertible foreign currencies overseas that Fulbright identified as a means of funding educational exchange. Fulbright's inspired idea was to earmark some of these monies for exchanges, and they were there for the taking. Years later, Fulbright said, the educational exchange program was not born of one of those great debates on which the United States Senate prides itself. It was little understood at the time. And he recognized that his bill was a potentially controversial idea. Therefore, he quietly moved it through Congress with a number of amendments, and President Truman signed the legislation that was to become known as the Fulbright Act into law on August 1, 1946. This is the Fulbright Act in its entirety. It is less than two pages long and highly technical, and it has an almost incomprehensible title. An act to amend the Surplus Property Act of 1944 to designate the State Department as the disposal agency for surplus property outside of the continental United States, its territories, and for other purposes. One of its so-called other purposes was to establish the exchange program Fulbright initially had proposed in September 1945. The Fulbright Act established the institutional architecture of the Fulbright program with its many moving parts by doing five things that can be illustrated using this organogram. The Fulbright Act opens with a long technical passage, establishing a role of the State Department as the sole agency for the disposal of surplus property overseas. The second part of the Act outlines the entire architecture of the program in one long run-on sentence that authorized the Secretary of State to conclude executive agreements with foreign governments 
that had purchased wartime surpluses and establish unique binational commissions with equal numbers of U.S. and partner country board members for local governance and management. And these commissions, in turn, hired local staff to run the program on the ground. With the revenues these commissions had at their disposal, they provided travel grants for outgoing students, teachers, and scholars to get them to their ports of entry in the United States and comprehensive grants for incoming U.S. grantees to cover their travel and living costs abroad. The program was based on the idea of binational governance and bilateral exchange. Transatlantic and transpacific travel for civilians was rare and prohibitively expensive in the 40s and the 50s, and most grantees traveled by ocean liner in the olden days. Fifth, a technical passage at the end of the Fulbright Act authorized the U.S. President to appoint a Board of Foreign Scholarships, the BFS, consisting of 10 members composed of representatives of cultural, educational, student, and war veteran groups. This representative cross-section of leading academics, university leaders, and experts were, as private citizens, responsible for establishing Fulbright program policies and governing the program. The State Department's Office for Exchanges, the forerunner of today's Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs, supported the BFS, which designated a number of well-established nonprofit educational and professional organizations, the so-called cooperating agencies, to administer the program in the U.S. They recruited American candidates for grants and helped orient and place grantees from abroad at American host institutions. The Fulbright program was based on reciprocal exchanges as mirror-reversed incoming and outgoing processes. Fulbright, who amended his bill to provide for an independent BFS, later circumscribed its creation as a first step in insulating the program from current political interests. Oscar Hanlon, the Pulitzer Prize-winning Harvard historian and chair of the BFS in the 60s, was more explicit. He called the BFS a unique governmental institution consisting of private citizens whose primary affiliations are academic and the product of an intention to keep the program free of either political or bureaucratic interference based on a commitment to the traditional conceptions of academic freedom. The Fulbright program was conceived as a highly non-governmental governmental program and this characteristic contributed to establishing its reputation and promoting its acceptance overseas. For example, eight of the ten members of the Board of Foreign Scholarships were well-known private educators, not government employees. The so-called cooperating agencies responsible for program support in the United States were reputable private, nonprofit, and professional educational organizations. And the binational commissions abroad, with their binational boards, were not instruments of either government but operated independently in the mutual interest of both. However, despite the ingenuity of the Fulbright Act, it had some major shortcomings. It only provided for funding in foreign currencies accrued through the sale of wartime surpluses overseas, which could cover all of the costs of comprehensive grants for U.S. grantees overseas, but only the travel costs of grantees from abroad to their points of entry in the United States. Due to the absence of U.S. dollar funding, there were no funds to cover the costs of the administration of the program in the United States or to provide for other expenses incurred by grantees from overseas in the U.S. Between 1947 and 1952, 28 countries and former theaters of war in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific established binational Fulbright commissions. But the program was limited to these countries with wartime surpluses. In these countries, the revenues from the sale of these surpluses were limited to and bound to be depleted. Fortunately, earmarking revenues from the sale of agricultural purchases overseas in 1954 extended the logic and the reach of the program, and 15 new agreements were signed between 1954 and 1960, with eight in Latin America. Two factors were decisive in offsetting these initial shortcomings in getting the Fulbright program off the ground. First, the BFS solicited support from the diverse institutions of American civil society 
and they collaborated to put comprehensive packages of cash and in-kind support together for incoming Fulbright grantees. Second, Congress passed the United States Information and Educational Exchange Act, better known as the Smith-Munt Act, in January 1948, 18 months after the Fulbright Act. Smith-Munt provided funding for the continuation and reorganization of U.S. propaganda and information programs after World War II, an information service to promote a better understanding of the United States and other countries by disseminating information about the United States abroad, and it established an educational exchange service to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and other countries and to cooperate with other nations. This provided urgently needed funding in U.S. dollars for the Fulbright program as well as for the establishment of other U.S. government exchange programs in the future. Once the component parts of the original mixed funding formula for the Fulbright program fell into place, the program was a resounding success. It consisted of foreign currencies for expenses overseas, U.S. dollars from Smith Month for U.S. dollar expenses in the States, and various forms of private cash and in-kind support for grantees from abroad in the United States. From 1945 until the establishment of the United States Information Agency in 1953, there also was an ongoing debate on how to best organize and administer peacetime propaganda information and exchange programs, activities funded by Smith-Munt. At the end of August 1945, five fundamentally different but complementary functional activities were incorporated into the Office of International Information and Cultural Affairs that, in turn, operated in five geographical policy regions. This office inherited the propaganda activities of the defunct Office of Wartime Information, the so-called fast media of print, radio, and film, along with the so-called slow media, such as libraries and the fledgling Exchange of Persons programs. In 1952 and 1953, Senator Fulbright and his Republican colleague from Iowa, Burke Hickenlooper, alternately chaired a special Senate subcommittee tasked to comprehensively evaluate the organization and the effectiveness of the United States Overseas Information Programs. They heard the testimonies of hundreds of practitioners and experts and collected thousands of pages of testimony. The advocates of exchange programs argued that there were fundamental differences between the long-term objectives of promoting international understanding through educational and cultural exchange programs based on the principles of bilateral dialogue, reciprocity, and the freedom of expression, and the short-term, day-to-day, policy-driven, unilateral messaging of information programs designed to inform, educate, and persuade foreign audiences in the American national interest. The arguments for organizationally segregating exchanges from information ultimately carried the day. When the United States Information Agency was established as an executive agency in 1953 to manage overseas print, radio broadcasting, film, and libraries, exchanges were not included in its portfolio. The State Department retained the management of international exchange programs in a small office called the Bureau of International Cultural Relations the forerunner of today's ECA. This put the final touches on the original architecture of the Fulbright program. Once everything had fallen into place, the Fulbright program boomed in the 1950s. By 1961, 41 countries with binational Fulbright commissions were participating in the program, which had over 50,000 alumni. On August 1, 1961, the 15th anniversary of the signature of the Fulbright Act to the day, President Kennedy invited Fulbright and the other politicians who had been instrumental in establishing the program to the White House for a commemoration. He noted that this program has been one of the great acts of creative and constructive statesmanship in the post-war period. Fulbright grants are known throughout the world for the ceaseless, informal, and effective work they do for better world understanding and for developing the talents of individuals. And he added, thanks to your leadership, Congress is presently considering new legislation which would consolidate and strengthen various existing legislation and thereby establish a firm basis for moving forward in the 60s. 
The purpose of this new legislation was to consolidate the Fulbright Act of 1946 and the Smith-Munt Act of 1948 into one new and more expansive piece of exchange legislation, the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961, better known as the Fulbright-Hayes Act, which Kennedy signed into law on September 21, 1961. The Fulbright-Hayes Act relied on the established strengths of the program by providing for the creation or continuation of binational or multinational educational and cultural foundations and commissions. It also invited foreign governments, international organizations, and private individuals, firms, associations, and agencies to participate in co-funding the program in the future. The institutionalization of binational cost sharing ingeniously provided new sources of revenue in foreign currencies for the Fulbright program in countries with binational commissions. It effectively replaced the program's reliance on the revenues from the sale of U.S. wartime or other surpluses overseas by introducing cash and in-kind contributions coming directly from partner country governments as a new source of foreign revenue. Furthermore, the Fulbright-Hayes Act provided for increased funding for exchanges as a line item in the U.S. budget, which allowed the State Department to extend the program to countries which had not concluded executive agreements to establish binational commissions. This introduced a new and different category of awards and gave the program a global reach. This new category of Fulbright grant relied on the existing stateside structures of the program for administrative support, and these grants were unilaterally funded and managed as part of a U.S. government program by U.S. embassies without the Fulbright program's trademark bilateral agreements by national commissions or co-funding opportunities. The five years following the signature of the Fulbright-Hayes Act were a period of optimism, increased funding, and dynamic growth. They established co-funding by partner governments as a new and important feature of the program, led to the conclusion of nine new executive agreements, including three in Africa and one with communist Yugoslavia, and extended the reach of the program globally. The first major crisis in the program's history coincided with its all-time funding peak in the mid-1960s. Fulbright's principled opposition to the United States' escalation of the Vietnam War ruptured his relationship with President Johnson a long-standing personal friend and political ally. Increased spending on the war put tremendous strain on the discretionary funding of the federal budget, and John Rooney, the powerful chair of the House Committee on Appropriations and a hawk on Vietnam, was skeptical about exchanges. These downside factors combined contributed to dramatic cuts in funding, totaling over 40 percent between 1966 and 69, and resulting in a 30% drop in the number of grants awarded. Then funding stagnated at low levels during the Nixon administrations in the 1970s. 1978 also was a milestone in the administration of the Fulbright program. A reorganization of USIA, then briefly called the International Communications Agency, entailed moving exchanges out of the State Department in with the other programs in the agency's information portfolio. And this putatively made Fulbright a USIA program. After the cuts of the late 60s and the stagnation of the 70s, funding for public diplomacy and exchanges picked up in the 80s under the Reagan administrations during the so-called Second Cold War. After the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union between 1989 and 1991, funding for public diplomacy peaked in 1994. And between 1990 and 1997, 10 new binational Fulbright commissions came into being, with six of them in the so-called new democracies in what had been called communist Eastern Europe. Ironically, a few years after the Berlin Wall fell, funding for USIN exchanges fell too, canceling many of the gains of the 1980s in real terms. Policymakers thought that USIA had served its purpose. It was downsized in the mid-90s, then, in 1999, broken up into its constituent parts. ECA and exchange programs were consolidated with the State Department. 9-11 and the advent of the global war on terror 
precipitated a renewed run-up in funding for exchanges, most of which flowed into embassy-based programs or into programming in the Muslim world between Morocco and the Philippines. For a retrospect on the funding history of the program, you have to look at the yellow bars on this graph from the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board's 2014 annual report, because they are in so-called constant dollars that show real dollar values in inflation-adjusted terms. U.S. government funding for Fulbright has been a roller coaster ride, with an absolute peak in 1966, followed by drastic cuts and stagnation in the 60s and 70s, a funding run-up in the 80s and early 90s, renewed cuts in 1996, then another run-up after 9-11. Funding for Fulbright Awards is lower today in real dollars than it was over 55 years ago in 1966, when there were fewer Fulbright programs in fewer countries, and it has been stretched to fund 49 binational commissions and over 100 embassy-based programs today. A look at the distribution of grantees between countries where the program is managed by Fulbright commissions and countries where it is managed by U.S. embassies illustrates some interesting trends since the late 70s, too. Funding and grantee numbers were stagnating at low levels in the late 70s when USAA started administering the Fulbright program. Since then, cumulative funding and grantee numbers have undulated upward and USIA and then the State Department have committed increasing amounts of funding to unilaterally managed embassy-based Fulbright programs in specific policy regions. However, countries with binational commissions dating back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 90s still form the philosophical and organizational foundation of the program. Over 78% of the program's alumni receive grants from binational Fulbright commissions. And since the Fulbright-Hayes Act of 1961, contributions from partner governments have increased steadily from zero to an average of about $100 million annually in recent years. More than 90% of the support from overseas comes from countries with binational commissions, many of which commit more funds annually to the program than the U.S. appropriation. Looking back on the grand scheme of things, binational commissions were part of the foundational ingenuity of the Fulbright Act 75 years ago, and they have been an important source of stability, growth, innovation, and resilience for the program ever since. Looking back at the history of the Fulbright program after 75 years from the vantage point of 2021, I think that one can still readily endorse President Kennedy's evaluation of the import and impact of the Fulbright program. Of all of the examples in recent history of beating swords into plowshares, of having some benefit come to humanity out of the destruction of war, I think that this program, in its results, will be among the most preeminent.